Well, good day again. <clears throat> Isn't it exciting to be living in 2020, right? With all this kind of stuff going on. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's a little disappointing too. Because I thought we'd be further along. Y you know, further along in life. Now, I'm not the only one who thinks this. Experts say, and there's experts for everything, we're not nearly as far along as we thought we would be. These experts, they call them futurists. They predict what will happen in the future. And, and it really seems like a pretty good job to have uh, if you can get it, because no one really knows you're doing a good job until it's too late to matter. Pretty good job to have. But these futurists, they said by 2020, by 2020, the most popular gift would be trips to outer space. Wow. And the reality is in 2020, the most popular gift is an Amazon gift card. Not quite the same thing at all. They predicted by now we would have landed on Pluto. Clearly not there yet. Matter of fact, we're deciding whether it's a planet or not, right? They said by now we, would be, we wouldn't be washing dishes anymore or doing laundry. How many are waiting for that day? <laughs> now we should have robots that do all of that stuff for us. There's no need for washing dishes or, ro or uh, laundry. They said by now our life expectancy would be 150 years old. Now, I got to tell you, I'm not making it. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think you're making it to 150. Especially when God's word says 120, right? <laughs> yeah. I thought actually we'd all be wearing those silver jumpsuits and teleporting to church. You know, like the flying cars and all. Kind of like, meet George Jetson, Jane, his wife. If you know what I'm singing about there, you're old. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Tammy. But you know, if I'm honest with you today, I thought I'd be further along too. I thought I had certain, certain things figured out by now. I, I thought I'd be a little more organized. I thought I'd be a little more disciplined. And I thought I'd be a lot less selfish. I thought I'd had this whole husband-father thing figured out. You know, I should be pro-level by now. But most days I'm just JV at best. Pride and greed and coveting. I thought those things would be so 2010. They're still there. So let's think about that for a moment in our own lives. How would you fill in the rest of this statement? I thought by now. <laughs> there, there you go. Fill in the rest of that. I asked some friends to finish this. Here's what some of them said. I thought by now I would have figured out my teenager. Good luck with that. I thought by now my marriage wouldn't be so much work. I thought by now someone would have put a ring on it. I thought by now I'd be out of debt. I thought by now I'd have six pack abs. You used to have them, Brian. And that didn't come from Brian either, amen? <laughs> I thought by now I would have stayed away from the bad stuff on the internet. I thought by now I'd be sober. I thought by now my husband would wash the dishes. I thought by now I'd have a successful career. I thought by now I wouldn't steal, feel, feel so betrayed and angry. I thought by now I'd be back into a size six. I thought by now the house remodel would be finished. I thought by now I'd be happy. And the list goes on and on. 
I, I thought by now. And as you ask yourself that question, there's a couple things I want you to consider. As you finish the statement, there's some questions you should ask yourself. And, and here's the first. How did I get to where I am currently? Yeah, how did I get to where I am currently? You look back and over the past years, you try and answer that question. And you pay attention to yourself. If you're starting to blame other people, my parents, my spouse, if God would have, that's not the right answer. Here's a second question to ask yourself. How do I get to where I want to be? How do I get to where I want to be? But here's the thing. The answer to both of these questions is the same answer. And the answer is one decision at a time. The answer to both of those questions is the same answer. One decision at a time. It's how you got where you are. It's how you get where you want to be. One decision at a time. Certainly there's mitigating circumstances and negative stuff that happens. But still, it's how you respond to those things one decision at a time. Some psychologist once said that life is the sum of your decisions. Now, most of us appreciate the ripple effect of big decisions. Certain decisions carry a lot of weight. Where I'm going to live, what am I going to do with my life, whom I'm going to marry. We understand the ripple effects of those big decisions. But we typically underestimate the cumulative effect of our small decisions. But here's something. Our small decisions many times make our big decisions easy. So if the big decision is whom I'm going to marry, then all the small decisions like who I am, what do I do, where do I give my heart and my mind, who do I date, how do I date, what do I look for in another person, all these small decisions really make that big decision. Just one little decision at a time. It adds up to explain where you are now and to determine where you'll be in the future. There's a book out there, it's called Atomic Habits. The author is James Clear. He, talk, he talks a little about making how these things have a big impact. He writes this, if you want to predict where you will end up in life, all you have to do is follow the curve of, it's what he calls tiny gains and tiny losses. And you'll see how daily choices will compound to determine who you will become 10 or 20 years down the line. Want to predict where you'll be? Look at your tiny decisions, your daily choices, and they'll determine where you'll be down the line. Now, the Bible calls this, and, and even nature calls this, the law of sowing and reaping. We read about it in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Man reaps what he sows. So here's what you and I want to do. Let me ask you to do this. When we look at making one decision at a time, think of every decision you make as a seed that's planted in the ground. Every decision we make, think of it as a seed planted in the ground. It's the law of sowing and reaping. And God's hardwired that into creation. If you plant a certain kind of seed, you're going to get a certain kind of fruit. You plant apple seeds and anybody know what you get? Pretty, pretty simple, huh? And it's true. But every decision that we make is like a seed that has been planted. And we're always going to get what we planted. You know, the law of sowing and reaping is kind of like gravity. You don't have to like the law of gravity. You don't even have to agree with the law of gravity to be affected by it. You can disagree with it. But if you trip and fall, guess what? You're going down. 
And it's true of the law of sowing and reaping. You can underestimate it. You can dismiss it. But it's still going to work. Every decision you make is a seed that you sow. And you always reap what you sow. And when I say that, here's my question. How do you hear that? Yeah, how do you hear that? I think some of us hear it as a warning. Some of us hear it as a threat. Maybe we're a little defensive about it. Maybe we're a little bit scared of it being true. What does that mean to you on your path that you're on? Some of it, I think, hear it as a promise. Because you know the seeds you've been planting. You know the decisions you've been making. And you know that God is going to make something good out of it. And the point is, the law of sowing and reaping can work for you or it can work against you. One decision at a time can work for you or against you. Think about it. A marriage falls apart one decision at a time. But one decision at a time is how you repair it. One decision at a time is how you get out of shape. Didn't seem like much, but just a cheeseburger here and there. Little relaxing, little no jog in the morning. But one decision at a time is how you fix it, right? One decision at a time is how you get into debt. It's just a charge on the credit card. But it's also how you get out of debt one decision at a time. It's how you get here and it's how you get out of here. It's just how it works. So, so now the question is, what are you sowing? And here's what you'll see as we study from John chapter 1. The decisions we make, one at a time, have not only the potential of where we will be, but it also impacts the people around us. One decision at a time is how Jesus changed the world. We'll see this in John chapter 1. John picks up in the life of Jesus, and Jesus is already 30 years old. And he's beginning his ministry, and we'll see how he changes things one decision at a time. John chapter 1, verse 35. The next day, John was there again. John was in Bethany baptizing with two of his disciples. Now, we're reading from the Gospel of John. Don't get confused about John the disciple. But this John we're referring to as John the Baptist. I affectionately call him JTB. Yeah. John was always baptizing. Anybody wonder how he got his name? Never mind. We won't get into a, a big discussion about that today. Verses 36 and 37. When he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. No doubt they've been listening to John the Baptist talk about Jesus. Later in a few chapters, if you remember, John the Baptist is going to be questioned as to, is he concerned that his disciples are leaving him to follow Jesus? And he says, absolutely not. He must increase and I must decrease. That was the controlling decision in John's life. He must increase and I must decrease. More of Jesus, less of me. You start to filter your decisions through that statement and people around you notice and start to follow Jesus. And that's what happened. So what does that look like? What would it mean for your decisions if you filtered them all through that kind of mindset. More of Jesus and less of me. Because most of us make our decisions with, with more of me in mind. What am I going to get out of it? What does this mean to me? How am I going to be noticed? What do I want to do? 
If you say more of Jesus and less of me, that means you need to respond with more humility when your pride's boiling up. It's a decision to give instead of spend. It's a decision to build up rather than tear down. It's a decision to wave someone in instead of cut someone off. It's a decision to give grace rather than get even. It's a decision to release your frustrations to God rather than ranting and raving about him on Facebook. It's a decision to say, look at Jesus instead of saying, look at me. And this is how John the Baptist lived his life based on he must become more, Jesus must become more, and I must become less. More of Jesus, less of me. And because of that, it's not surprising when people around him started to follow Jesus. And that's just what happens. That's what happened here. Several of his disciples start to follow Jesus. Verse 37, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Verse 38 says, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? They're, I imagine they're, they're following along behind Jesus and they're following him, but they're not his followers yet. And Jesus is walking and he takes a look behind and says, what do you want? Maybe he walks a little further and looks again and goes, what? The way that's translated for most of us is, what are you looking for? And isn't that a pretty good question? It's a good question to consider when you're thinking through decisions. What do we want? What are we looking for? And this is really tricky because it gets us in trouble. Because we make decisions based on what we want right now, but that decision may not lead us to where we want to be later. Let's say you want to be in shape later. It means you may make a decision today that you don't even want to do right now. You may decide not to sleep in. You may decide to pass on that strawberry or butterscotch Sunday. But what I really want, because what I really want is to be in shape. Sometimes you have to ask, what do I really want question to make the right decision? We're so instant though, aren't we? We make decisions based on what we want right now. Anybody ever see those tins they sell at Christmas time? They sell them in Walmart and Target and Hickory Farms with some Christmas picture on the tin or a picture of a golden retriever or a snowman and inside the tin are three different kinds of popcorn. Anybody ever see those? Caramel coated and cheese coated and butter flavored and they have these cardboard dividers that keep the different flavors separate. Now, normally I'm not allowed to have that much caramel coated popcorn, but during Christmas, especially if it comes as a gift. Remember I said Walmart, Target, Hickory Farms, write those down. <laughs> My wife can't complain too much and say, and stop eating the caramel coated popcorn. Because I say, it was a gift. And around that time, I get to eat all the caramel coated popcorn I want. And I can mention that today because Martha's not here. Now, when the can gets opened, I'm eating, but I'm only eating one of those options because I believe the other two are just filler. So quick question here. Given the choice and you can only eat one of those kinds of popcorn, which one do you choose? Raise your hand. Butter flavored? How about cheddar cheese flavored? And how many of you people who are going to heaven are going to pick the delicious caramel-coated ones. Come on! 
Let me say that again. And how many of people you who are going to heaven are going? <laughs> That's where they separate the sheep from the goats, I got to tell you. Because there's no dividers in heaven. It's all caramel coated. So I sat there and I ate one piece of caramel coated popcorn at a time. One decision at a time. Apparently someone in my family wanted some caramel popcorn. Go figure. It was my gift anyway. But truth be told, I didn't even realize I did it. I just ate from it all day long, one piece at a time, without even realize I was making a decision to do it. I was just doing what I wanted to do, and isn't that how it works? Left unchecked, what we want in a moment determines our decisions, and it ends up being, well, maybe a little bit destructive. But it's how many of us make decisions. We don't really think about it. We just do what we want in the moment. But the problem is that what we want in the moment can mean hurting people around us. And it doesn't lead us to who we are and where we want to be in the future. Here's how James Clear put it in the book I referred to, Atomic Habits. He says this, as a general rule, the more immediate pleasure you get from an action, the more strongly you should question whether it aligns with your long-term goals. The more, if you really want to do something right now, you should stop and ask yourself, does this align with who I really want to be? And so Jesus asks them, he asks the disciples, the fo people following him, he says, what do you want? For what are you searching? Here's verses 38 and 39. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Here's the first part of verse 39. Come, he replied, and you will see. First words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of John are, what do you want? And come and see. What are you looking for? Come and see. Today, maybe you're not so sure about Jesus. I think Jesus would say to you here what he said in John's gospel. Well, what do you want? Come and see. What are you looking for? What's missing in your life? Come here and see. And that's what happens here. Verses 39 and 40. Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Here's verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John the Baptist had said and who followed Jesus. Verse 41. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ. Now I'm sure Peter had some questions about this, like, Andrew, how do you know? Do you got some evidence on this thing? How can you be sure? And to be quite frank, Andrew didn't know all the answers to the questions. First part of verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, Andrew doesn't show up a lot in scripture, but when he does, here's what he's doing. He's bringing people to Jesus. Three times we see Andrew in scripture and all three times he's bringing people to Jesus. I want that to be me too. When I show up that I'm bringing someone to Jesus. Here's the rest of verse 42. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So, so check this out. So John the Baptist makes a decision to point Andrew to Jesus. And Andrew makes a decision to point Peter to Jesus. And this is how the gospel changed the world. 
one person at a time telling one person at a time about Jesus. And this is how we as a church want to be part of changing the world. It's one person at a time telling one person at a time. It's one person at a time making one decision at a time that will point people, that will point the people in their lives to Jesus. That's the plan, y'all. With that in mind, as we finish up today, I just want to ask a couple questions. First three questions are more to people who are followers already. And they may seem little at first, but the power of little decisions being made is when they're made by us all are huge. Here's the questions. And when I ask these questions, you may remember a message series we talked about in the past. See if you do. Question one, will you decide to be the branch and spend 1% of your time weekly connecting to Jesus? Remember, be the branch was one of our mantras. Jesus is the vine, we are the branch. Our job is to stay connected to him. I'm saying, will you spend 1% of your time weekly connecting to Jesus? There are 10,080 hours in a week. Using round numbers, I'm asking you for 100 minutes a week. Now, some of you are saying, well, I got 45 minutes in today, Steve. No, that doesn't count. Bible study does. Prayer meeting does. Sunday night Bible study does. Home study does. Practicing what you learned in the community does. Studying God's word, praying each day. Asking God to guide your decisions each day. If we all do it, we will have a tremendous impact. Question number two, will you decide to wreck the roof and invite one person to come to church with you in 2020? Remember wreck the roof? Friends bringing a friend to Jesus. Couldn't get there, so they dug through the roof. Crazy stuff like that. Invite just one person here or online Andrew doesn't have all the answers but he goes to Peter and says come and see here's what I've found statistically about 75% of people who are asked to go to church by a friend will go so why don't we just do that Let's make that the plan. Not advertisements, not pamphlets, not sticking things on windows of cars, not mailings, not signs. Just friends asking friends. One person at a time, reaching them one person at a time. Pretty cool, huh? Here's question three. Will you decide to empty the jar? Remember that? And increase your giving 1% in 2020 from wherever you're at. And not just giving here, giving to whatever has God called, has called you to support. Feed the Hungry, World Relief, Parkersburg Church, Christian Children's Fund, the church camp, the missions we support. And not just money. What about increasing your time 1%? Last question, and this one's really important. And it's maybe not for you all here today. Maybe not for those who have, have claimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but for others who need that opportunity. Question four is, will you decide to become a follower of Jesus? If you can make one big decision, sometimes it has a way of taking care of the little ones. See, it works both ways, right? Who you will marry, what do you want from life, integrity, compassion, even what you watch on TV. Making one big decision sometimes takes care of all the other little decisions. 
Following Jesus makes you better equipped to decide what you watch on TV. Following Jesus is sort of like buttoning a shirt. If you start with the top button, if you start at the top right, all the others fall in line. When you decide to follow Jesus, it's a top button decision. Make that one and a lot of other decisions get a lot easier. See, that's the most important decision. Will you decide to become a follower of Jesus today?